So welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is on the subject of creating a crisis resistant culture in a new area, new area, a new era of reputational risk. Um, thank you for sparing the time today. I'm going to spend the next 40 minutes or so talking about this important topic. There will be time for questions throughout, so please post any questions to the uh, question box on your control panel on the right hand side and we'll deal with as many of those questions as we can at the end of the webinar. I think uh, I know most of the people who have joined this webinar but uh, for those of you who are new to Insignia or new to these webinars, my name is Jonathan Hemus, I'm the Managing Director of Insignia I'm also the author of Crisis Proof, an award-winning book on crisis management, and professionally, Insignia helps leaders of businesses around the world to do and say the right things on the most challenging days of their business lives. And those challenging days can come in various different uh, shapes and sizes, to, to some extent, dependent upon the kind of organization that you are. And so to start us off with a little bit of audience participation, I'd love you to uh, participate via Slido. You just need to use your mobile phone, iPad or other device to scan that QR code, which will take you to Slido. Or alternatively, you can join via the slido.com uh, website address and then enter that code and just jot down a number of the risks or crisis types that you or the leaders of your organization are most concerned about. So uh, humor me please, do, do take part, uh, click through onto the uh, QR code or use the slido.com address and submit those risks or crisis types that you or the leaders of your organization are most concerned about? What do you think is keeping your organization awake at night? I can see people typing. If you're not within Slido, please do give it a go, even if you're uh, uh, a one-person band, put in what's keeping you awake at night. Okay, there's three people still typing, so let's give it another 30 seconds and then let's uh, take a look at the results. Catherine, I might need your assistance in advising me on how to show the results. Fingers crossed I've got this, got this covered. Uh, 20 seconds. I think everybody has now finished typing, so let's... Oh no, one person, five seconds. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to, there we go. So, fascinating, isn't it? Um, <laughs> there is one, one topic which dominates all others at the moment, uh, which is cyber risks. And we're gonna come back to that actually uh, later on in this presentation. But there are plenty of other, um, there are plenty of other topics there. Um, we've got reputation risks and reputational, sustainability, environmental, marketing errors, geopolitical, fire, safety. There's a number of others within that outer ring which are also to do with cyber. So, okay, so that's what um, your leaders are um, currently concerned about. Well, I think what's true is that um, whatever crisis type it is that you're concerned about, some of those crises are truly out of your hands. In other words, you have little or no control over whether they happen or not. However, there is a very big 
uh, category of crises in which you do have an influence either to prevent them or in some cases to cause or certainly allow them to occur and a large part of those crises are reputational risks and incredibly these uh, five stories uh, which are all about reputational crises these cuttings are all from the last four weeks each of them posing a major challenge to the organization in question and uh, we have uh, Carol Carolyn McCall the um, CEO of ITN in the middle of this uh, slide because literally just half an hour ago she was before a select committee uh, at the Houses of Parliament um, talking about ITV's uh, response to the Philip Schofield uh, affair. It's not just the individuals uh, who are caught in the uh, firing line in this situation, but the organization itself. How did they allow this to happen? Have they, uh, have they let down their employees in terms of duty of care? Bottom left, this was a story that came out yesterday that the Scout Movement has paid out millions of pounds uh, to settle abuse claims. Bottom right, um, the racism investigation at Yorkshire Cricket Club, you see the impact of that. Reputationally, it's been uh, incredibly harmful. It's been uh, also very harmful in financial terms. They're facing three million losses. Um, top right, this was a story which really broke at the uh, weekend. Uh, whereby allegations regarding Crispin Odie has forced him out of the company that was uh, named after him and has caused many of that uh, financial institution's uh, uh, partners, financial business partners, to withdraw their support for the organization. And then top left, I thought this was a really interesting one. This is uh, coverage from this Sunday's Sunday Times, and it relates to an interview uh, with its CEO, its CEO of uh, two years standing. But what is the beginning of that article about it? Something that happened three years ago when Rio Tinto inadvertently or carelessly uh, blew up an ancient Aboriginal uh, burial site, a very um, holy place for um, native Australians. And as a consequence caused massive damage to its reputation and its relationships uh, with its key stakeholders. What was the start of the interview for, an, for a, a, a CEO who wasn't even CEO when this, uh, when this event happened? It was how is he still picking up the pieces from that issue of three years ago? So I guess the message here is that my perception is that these reputational style of crises are becoming more common, if anything. They are having a big impacts, yes, on reputation, but also on business, value, finance, and even license to operate. And they hang around for a long time. So this is really the uh, area that we're going to be considering over the next 40 minutes or so. What we also know is that when a crisis strikes at the heart of an organization's values and uh, a slightly uh, less pleasant picture of the organization emerges, that is when the value of an organization is most likely to dip in the most dramatic way. This is um, the research done by Oxford Metrica, which shows what happens to the value of organizations in the aftermath of a crisis. And that red line, that is particularly populated by organizations in which a crisis either uncovered the truth of a culture and values which were not what the organization said they were in terms of the crisis itself, or organizations whose response to a crisis was not in keeping with their values. So this is why 
getting your response to a reputational crisis right is so important. Here are some other reasons why getting your response to reputational crisis is so important. You only have one reputation. You can't buy a new one, you can't insure it. So if your factory burns down, that is a huge problem, but you can build another factory. It's easier to build another factory than it is to build a new reputation. A reputational crisis is the acid test of management, who you really are and what you stand for. In other words, organizations uh, communicate and they go about their normal business lives and they create an impression of the organization, its reputation, its people, its operations. But it's only when you hit the toughest of times that it becomes clear to the outside world what this organization is really about. Stakeholders do have long memories. That's why Rio Tinto's issue of three years ago is still the headline in an interview with its CEO. And it does seem to be that recovery from a reputational crisis takes longer than one than from a traditional operational crisis. So the effects uh, are longer lasting and gaining people's trust back once you've lost it is a long and arduous journey. So why is it that reputational crises seem to attract greater stakeholder scrutiny and broader stakeholder scrutiny than a traditional operationally focused crisis? Well, we know for those of you that come from a journalistic background, and I know there are a couple on this webinar, news is all based on human interest and even better if it's scandal. So human interest and scandalous uh, uh, crises are more likely to attract attention. Secondly, though, it does also, these kinds of crises speak to the character of an organization and its leaders. And often the crisis itself is kind of seen as the tip of the iceberg. It suggests deeper and broader and longer lasting failings within an organization. And what we see is that stakeholders will very quickly shun toxic organizations or people. As I say, in the Crispin Odie case, you know, a number of critical business uh, partners are uh, removing themselves from uh, links with, with the firm. Whenever we see uh, a celebrity uh, come into the spotlight for the, for the wrong reasons, we suddenly see the organizations that formerly had them front and center in terms of their promotional activity, dropping them um, like hot bricks. So there are reasons why reputational crises uh, attract greater stakeholder scrutiny than a more traditional operational uh, crisis. I think these are also the kinds of crises that can wrong foot organizations, not least organizations whose business is not actually about um, the softer, the softer side, the people side. For example, VW will all recall Dieselgate, the emissions scandal. So the biggest crisis that VW has faced in recent years is not to do with uh, a, faulty, a faulty vehicle or a factory which was taken down because of a cyber attack. It was because of the behaviors of its leaders in fiddling the emissions test results. So interesting to note that it was something, nothing to do with what VW would um, call its core business that has actually posed it the biggest challenge. Professional services businesses, however, maybe are more likely to uh, be the victim of a reputationally focused crisis. Bell Pottinger, a uh, communications consultancy that no longer exists, 
ceased to exist because of controversial and many believed unethical uh, campaigns that it was uh, conducting in South Africa, which were deemed to be um, controversial at the very least and inappropriate by many. Uh, they were accused of stirring up racial stereotypes and racial disharmony and posing as people that, that they weren't. That brought a successful, large PR consultancy to its knees and ended its existence. So I think particularly if you are in professional services, you really need to be thinking about reputational risk. And of course, in the UK, the um, most recent and biggest reputationally focused crisis has been uh, the CBI, which has been accused of having toxic a toxic culture with a number of serious allegations coming out about the behavior of uh, its former CEO and other executives and employees of the voice of business. So I think what we can learn from the CBI, CBI and indeed many of the other reputational crises that I've just touched on are that be very clear, not all crises are linked to physical events or incidents. Reputational crises are on the increase. Leadership behaviors, attitude and actions are under closer scrutiny now than ever before. Creating a crisis resistant culture is critical. Doing and saying the right things in a timely manner are essential. Shaping the narrative is challenging but essential. And by the way, one of the um, subplots of the CBI uh, crisis was the uh, CEO who was forced out was the first to speak extensively to the media seizing the narrative and influencing the narrative to the further detriment of the CBI. It's a very good example of where if the organization doesn't uh, take a proactive approach to communication and lead the discussion, then others will do it for you and they may very well be communicating things which are not to your best advantage. Prioritize your key stakeholders. And by the way, in a reputational crisis, as is the case with um, many others, but particularly in a reputational crisis, your own people will be critical in terms of stakeholders. Do make sure that they are well communicated with. And as we've seen from some of the earlier uh, examples, this type of crisis can pose a truly existential threat. So building on our first uh, slide, the, uh, the one regarding uh, what risks are you and your leaders concerned about? I wanted you to uh, have a think about, about this. Uh, when did you last rehearse your response to a cyber incident? In the last six months? In the last 12 months? In the last three years? More than three years ago or never? I promise you these responses are anonymous. Um, Catherine is going to launch the poll please uh, tick or click more to the point against whichever is the correct answer for you or your organization. I think there's a number of people still to still to vote. If uh, I could ask everybody to cast their vote in the next 30 seconds, please. We're getting there. We've now got two thirds of people have voted. So if you haven't yet voted, please uh, please cast your vote now. I'll give you 15 seconds. Five. Still time to cast your vote, three seconds. Okay, so Catherine, if you could uh, make that live, please. 
So is everybody seeing those uh, results? If you're not, let Catherine or me know, but the results are that 27% have rehearsed their response to a cyber incident in the last six months, an additional 33% in the last 12 months, with 7% rehearsing more than three years ago, and a third uh, not having rehearsed their cyber response at all. Okay, we're now going to move on to the uh, next poll, which is, when did you last rehearse for a crisis on inappropriate, unethical, or illegal management behaviour? And it's the same timeframes as uh, last time, so that poll is now open. If you can cast your vote for this one, please. Again, already uh, over half of you have voted. We're up to about two thirds now. So again, just give the remainder of people another 15, 20 seconds to cast their vote. Okay, Catherine, we can close that close that now. So the results of uh, that poll were 7% in the last six months, seven, a further 7% in the last 12 months, 14% in the last three years, 29% more than three years, and 43% never. So 60% of you had rehearsed your cyber response in the last 12 months. Only a quarter as many, 14%, have rehearsed their response to a crisis focused on inappropriate, unethical or illegal management behaviour. 86% of today's attendees, and these are people who are interested and focused on crisis management, 86% have not rehearsed their response to a reputationally focused crisis focusing on inappropriate management behaviour in the last year. Now, I am certainly not saying that rehearsing for a cyber incident is not uh, important, but it is, is it four times more important than rehearsing for reputational crisis? Are there more cyber incidents than reputational crises? Are cyber incidents more impactful than reputational uh, crises? Open questions, but I think the point I'm making is probably um, clear. Um, the point I'm making is um, you do need to re rehearse for these kinds of crises as well as the more traditional crises. So why don't organisations do that? Um, the answer is, well, a number of things, but firstly, because actually it's a lot more comfortable to consider those crises which come from the outside in, the right-hand side of this matrix. In other words, no one wants anything bad to happen to their organisation, but it is easier to plan and rehearse for situations which are done to you rather than situations which are caused by you, which are the things on the left-hand side. It's also much easier to conceive of and think about things which relate to technical or economic factors, things like accidents or IT incidents or even fires. What's less comfortable to deal with is things related to people, particularly people, senior people maybe, uh, that are guilty of wrongdoing. And so there's a level of discomfort and embarrassment and a feeling of uh, inappropriateness 
uh, around thinking about those more people related crises. This isn't all organizations. Literally this week we did uh, a full simulation with a financial services uh, client where the story was entirely based upon uh, a rogue but very senior member of the team who was acting both unethically and illegally. Um, and they previously really only ever focused on cyber incidents. So there are organizations that are prepared to go there, but many more are not. So this is the challenge. Let's look at some of the um, let's look at some of the solutions. So prevention strategies. I guess the most powerful thing you can do to prevent a reputational crisis is to create a crisis resistant culture. If actually you create the reverse, you may end up with the catastrophic situation that Boeing faced with the two crashes of the 737 MAX and the 346 people that died and then all of the other fallout from that uh, awful pair of incidents. As Scott Hamilton, an aviation analyst at the Leeham Company said, when you create a culture of pressure where engineers and technical pilots feel they cannot bring up safety concerns because of cost and timing pressures because of their jobs, that's a culture that emanates from the top. And at this point, I would commend anybody who's you know really interested in crisis management and who wants to learn more about how culture can influence an organization's proneness to crisis, I'd really advise you to read the book Flying Blind, which is the story of the 737 MAX and how the crashes came to happen. It's a fascinating read, or you can get it as an audio book. But yeah, it's, I would say it's required reading for those who are really interested and care about crisis management. So let's look at this topic of culture from a different point of view. Many of you on this call who are crisis management professionals will know that ISO um, came out with guidelines the end of last year, ISO 22361 guidelines for crisis management. And I was delighted to see within that, that they included recommendations related to creating a crisis resistant culture. What did they say uh, that required? Well, it aligned, it required your crisis management objectives to be aligned with your organization's strategic direction and values. This is all about dealing and preventing crisis in the way that you have professed your organization would behave in business as usual. Continually identify and understand organizational risks. Be vigilant, be curious, be proactive. Commit to and acknowledge the importance of crisis management. This is clearly particularly relevant to leaders of organizations. When the CEO is the first person through the door for a crisis exercise, you know that organization has a crisis resistant culture. Encourage people to recognize and address early warning signs, to be vigilant and to be encouraged to uh, raise the alarm to support resilience planning, again, particularly leaders, encouraging everyone to understand their role and contribution to helping you succeed. Communicating goals, objectives, and vision for crisis management through training and exercises. I think everybody on this call knows that having a crisis management plan is important, but it is never enough without training and exercises. Without training and exercises, the plan will not be used when the crisis comes. And empowering people to challenge appropriately and or raise concerns. Many of the cases that uh, I have showcased over the last 20 minutes or so after the event, people say, well, we knew something was wrong or we knew that there were problems here, but we just were not able to get our voices heard. A more simplistic way uh, of looking at how to create or how to prevent rather than create uh, a crisis 
uh, a crisis prone culture are some of these which is almost a checklist if your organization recognizes and is prepared to admit that a crisis could affect you that's a tick in the box if you're committed to crisis planning training and exercising that is uh, an indicator of a good crisis culture encouraging behaviors which reduce risk focusing people in the right areas welcoming challenge empowering staff to deal with frontline issues being alert to early crisis indicators learning from incidents and near misses not just letting them pass and breathing a huge sigh of relief and particularly as leaders being active vocal champions of crisis prevention if you hear some of the phrases on the right hand side then you know that you may have a problem i just want to go back to the encouraging behaviors which reduce risk by encouraging what i also mean is incentivizing and just as importantly not incentivizing ways of working that are likely to cause crisis in other words if people are incentivized on purely on productivity or sales or output that focus on just getting stuff out the door could very clearly be at the detriment of safety and again um, if you listen to the uh, flying blind uh, audiobook or, or, or read that book there were elements which changed within Boeing's culture that put the focus more on um, finance and uh, Wall Street than it used to do that the author of that book makes a very strong case uh, that that was one of the factors that uh, led to those accidents occurring so think about your organization think about uh, whether you have uh, a crisis resistant culture or one where there are one or two areas of concern that need to be addressed okay so moving on how do we specifically prepare for a reputational crisis well i just want to say once again it really begins with culture but if the culture is right it also needs to be paired with good governance that um, flaws or contraventions are picked up from a kind of crisis management uh, assessment and planning point of view I would really recommend a reputational risk assessment in other words making sure that the risk assessments that are done within your business are not just operationally or financially focused that they really embrace the things that could do most harm to your reputation and one of the uh, most effective ways of doing that is actually bringing some outsiders in to participate in that risk assessment particularly those that are critics or naturally challenging individuals because again there is a bit of a um, emperor's new clothes syndrome whereby if you're too close to the organization it's hard to see some of those more unpalatable reputational risks scenario planning once you have identified um, what those reputational risks might be actually walking through how would you respond to an event of this kind and sense checking and horizon scanning what i really mean by that is understanding how the external mood and the external landscape has changed for example the me too movement um, that has changed expectations of behavior quite rightly and it has also uh, again quite rightly made journalists employees regulators uh, uh, law, law enforcers much more proactive much more um, inquiring about behaviors that exist within organizations and it's important to recognize that changing landscape and to um, prepare accordingly but as always everything i've said before is important but actually this thing about exercising is critical 
it's as I said earlier, it's quite right that you exercise against cyber risks, but I really think that every organization should also be doing exercises based on reputational risks. Simply doing that actually is a signifier of a crisis resistant culture. There are currently, as we saw from the poll, not that many organizations that are brave enough or courageous enough to do that. Those that do, they are the ones that I believe um, have a genuinely crisis resistant culture because they are prepared to believe that the worst could happen to them. Going through that exercise enables your team to rehearse its decision making in this kind of a crisis. If we're dealing with very sensitive human issues within a crisis of this kind, decision making is particularly difficult and actually going through an exercise, it allows you to literally rehearse how you would deal with a situation like that, test out what decisions you would make and the ramifications of them. Also communication, uh, even more so in a reputational communication, retaining the trust of your stakeholders is going to be critical. Exercising will of course identify risks, flaws, issues and areas for attention. It will therefore generate actions which will allow the organization to reduce the risk of this kind of a situation occurring. And it will also flag up where you need to have contingencies in place. And by contingencies, they can be um, pre-prepared um, communication materials. They can be expert advisors or, or, or support teams uh, that you might need in the event of a crisis of this nature. So those are some of the things that I think would be helpful to do uh, in advance of a crisis of this nature. How should you respond should your organization actually face a situation similar to the ones that we've been talking about earlier? Well, a couple of things uh, that are critical recognize what is really at stake in a crisis of this nature and what is really at stake is firstly people's trust and confidence in you as an organization and as we have seen potentially what is at stake is the very existence of your organization so it needs to be treated with the utmost seriousness and the utmost urgency. And we've seen that that's what the CBI has been doing over the last few weeks, fighting for its very existence. And as a guiding principle, you should respond to the situation in a way which exemplifies your reputation, the very best of your organization, in order to counterbalance the allegations that are being put to show the organization at its best when it is facing the worst. Now, there is also a pretty well-established uh, playbook to dealing with a crisis of this kind where there's been misbehavior uh, by one or more members of your team. And it tends to go like this. Suspend or remove the perpetrator or perpetrators show care, concern, and contrition about what has happened, restate the organization's values and express how what has happened is very much outside of those values, commission an independent review of how this was allowed to happen, commit to change, and act on that commitment. It is a good um, equation. It is a good toolkit to deploy uh, in a crisis of this kind but those five sub bullet points hide you know a whole world of uh, decision making and sensitivities that need to be navigated for example you know in most of these situations there will be someone who is accused of something who quite rightly um, has to be seen as innocent until proven guilty but there is also someone making the allegations who is potentially a victim of you know some awful event or series of events so balancing up the rights of the person who's been accused with the rights of the person who's making the allegations is a sensitive uh, challenge to uh, navigate so 
that playbook is useful, but it doesn't come without the requirement for your crisis management team to show leadership, judgment, and again, critically, stay true to your values when making some of those really difficult, difficult calls. We're probably about five minutes away from uh, the opportunity for uh, questions. So if you do have questions, please do uh, post those and we'll cover off as many as we can in the final few minutes of the webinar. Um, actions, I've talked there about kind of the overall approach. What are some of the actions which are going to help you uh, in a crisis of this nature? Well, I've said it needs to be treated with the utmost seriousness and urgency. Therefore, you need to address it with commitment and urgency. That requires quick communication. You'll remember right at the beginning, we talked about there is um, bigger stakeholder attention on a crisis of this kind than a traditional operational crisis. Therefore, everybody's gonna be talking and expressing a view about what's going on. You can't afford to be the last person to communicate. Take responsibility, and by taking responsibility, what I mean at least is take responsibility for putting this situation right. Um, be emotional, personal, and empathetic. You know, a cold, calculating, a corporate statement devoid of emotion will not resonate well if somebody has been uh, harmed as a result of what your organization or someone in it has done. Deploy spokespeople who epitomize your brand, the face of the organization in responding to an organization like this needs to be one with whom people uh, can engage, someone that they can uh, believe, someone who they trust, and someone who comes across as genuinely warm and caring. You will need to regularly update your stakeholders, and as I mentioned earlier, in terms of stakeholders, in a crisis of this nature, probably your number one stakeholder group is going to be your own people who will themselves feel under siege, disappointed, worried. They will also be worrying that their personal brand is going to become toxic. They won't want to admit who they work for. So keeping them as far as possible on side is a, uh, an important challenge. Identify and plan for worst case scenarios. So once a uh, situation like this breaks, you need people thinking about, within your team, you need people thinking about what could happen next? How could this difficult situation become even worse so that you are ideally a step ahead of next developments rather than constantly uh, reacting and responding to them? And clearly what you need to do is to take all steps to prevent a recurrence of whatever it is that has happened. Um, it's hard enough to um, regain your reputation following one serious incident of this nature. If this incident is followed up three months or six months later with a similar situation, it becomes almost impossible to recover. So do everything in your power to avoid a recurrence of what happened. Uh, I'm going to finish uh, the webinar, say before questions and kind of what next, with an example uh, of an organization that I think in terms of its response to a very challenging situation did an extremely good job. So this was Oxfam in 2018. You may recall some of these horrific allegations made about um, Oxfam staff in Haiti uh, after the earthquake. Um, and again, this is a situation which is made even worse by the fact that Oxfam as an organization is there to care for people and help people and make their lives better. These kind of headlines absolutely cut across everything that the organization stands for and therefore was an existential threat to the organization. It was never going to be easy for, or easy or quick 
for Oxfam to recover from that. But what they did do in terms of their response was very well judged. They took out full page advertisements in national newspapers on the left hand side and you can see what their key message was. How many organisations find it hard to say we are so sorry. Oxfam knew that those were the only words that could possibly begin to uh, communicate what they needed to say. They also at the same time set out a 10 point action plan to strengthen its safeguarding policies and a commitment to transform its organizational culture. So we come back to culture again. They backed up those words with actions. They tripled their investment in safeguarding. They created a new position of director of safeguarding. And as often happens in situations post-crisis, they swiftly appointed a new CEO. They also created a section on their website, a prominent section on their website, explaining the steps that Oxfam was taking to make real change. And they welcomed questions and interactions uh, from people looking at that website. As a consequence, Oxfam is still around today. So that brings me pretty much to the end of the presentation. This is a, uh, a face, a slide and a quote that you will have seen uh, on many presentations. I think it is particularly true of the kind of crises that we've been talking about today. Warren Buffett said, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. Um, there are a couple of resources that I'm going to turn your attention to before we take a couple of questions. Um, so in the follow-up email to this webinar, there will be a link to uh, a white paper that we drafted on how to create a crisis resistant culture and what are the key elements of that. So that will be available um, via the link in the email that you receive. Um, also, there is a section on culture within our crisis scorecard. There's other areas of crisis preparedness included as well, but there is a whole section related to crisis culture. So if you want to uh, evaluate, benchmark um, what your level of um, crisis preparedness is in terms of culture, we will include a link to that crisis readiness test in the follow-up email. And uh, as always, uh, there is, anyone who hasn't uh, yet read Crisis Proof, if you reply to the uh, email that you'll receive after this webinar, we will include you in a draw to win a free copy of the book. So without further ado, we will come to questions. We've got time for a couple, certainly. Um, the first one, is how can you get leaders who don't want to consider risks of this kind to do so? Yeah, I guess this is the um, how do you lead a, or you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Frankly, um, a crisis resistant culture does begin from the top. So if you have very um, senior people who don't want to engage with risks of this kind, you do have uh, a challenge. However, one of the ways that uh, I think works quite well is almost depersonalizing it, not focusing it on you as an organization, but actually maybe using one of the previous um, cases, identifying an organization which is somewhat similar to your own and setting up a 45, 60 minute discussion with your leadership team to say, competitor X faced this situation. Of course, it wouldn't happen to us, but if it did, how would we respond? And to make sure that we never get into a situation like this, what else could we do 
to further reduce the possibility of it happening to us. So most people in whatever um, industry or sector they operate um, will be engaged and interested in what's happening to competitors. So I find that's a really good time and a really technique, a really good technique to get people who don't want to confront potential failings in their own organization to do so because in a way you are talking about a competitor not yourself but the lessons and learnings can be just uh, as valuable so that's um that's my suggestion on uh, getting that particular horse to water and hopefully getting it to drink as well um next question do you believe the increase or your perception with which I agree in reputational crises has come about because of individuals during COVID lockdowns re reviewing and resetting their own personal values, leading to more outcries about behavior. I think it's a really interesting uh, thought, Mark. I do think that people are now um, much more aware and care much more about the behaviors of people in positions of power as always i don't think um i don't think our politicians have helped in terms of uh in terms of some of the behaviors we've seen there and i do think the same thing applies to um business leaders so yes i think people expect uh higher standards these days and sadly um they never fail to be let down with regard to that um I think that is the uh, last question that we have. I know we've got another one, another couple actually, sorry. So let me, uh, so is there any accurate or scientific way that you're aware of to determine what your reputation rests on and where future reputation risk may emerge? Nira, that's a great, a great question. Um, in terms of the first half of it, uh, is there an accurate way of determining what your reputation rests on? I would say, first of all, you should know because if you have created the reputation effectively, to a large extent, it should be shaped by you. However, to test that, I think it is about talking to your stakeholders and it you know, could very much be good old fashioned uh, market research, talking to your investors, talking to your customers, talking to your employees, talking to all of the people uh, who will have a perception of your reputation and getting their perspective on it and asking them what they would expect of you. Um, because it is those expectations that will be put to the test in a reputational crisis of this kind so um talk to your stakeholders i mean as an example of where i think organizations should know i always talk about if you think about um virgin atlantic and if you think of a real low cost budget airline of your choice uh, if those two organizations two airlines were to suffer a crisis based on um poor customer service or customers being abused or mistreated would it be the low-cost budget airline that suffered most harm to its reputation or would it be virgin atlantic i would suggest it would be virgin atlantic because they have built their reputation on being really customer centric whereas maybe the low-cost budget airline has built its reputation on getting you there cheaply and you don't expect to be treated particularly brilliantly. So yeah, understanding uh, the essence of your reputation uh, is, really, um, is really important. Okay, so it is now five to the hour. Thank you very much for your uh, participation and attendance uh, of this session. Uh, if there's anything that I can do to uh, help or if you have any other questions i'd be more than happy to um, pick those up offline uh, drop me a line or call me uh, via any of these these channels uh, we will be having uh, another webinar mid uh, july we're going to be joined by an expert into um, 
social engineering and the uh, human factor in cyber security and indeed the um, the vulnerability assigned to uh, people in cyber security. So I think that's going to be a really interesting session. Today though has been about uh, reputational risk. Um, I trust you found this uh, useful and interesting. As I say, do let me know if you have any further questions. Otherwise, thank you all for joining. Have a crisis-free afternoon and I look forward to seeing you again at our next webinar.